A very warm welcome to you all this morning, whether you are regular worshippers with us, visitors, whether you are here physically in the church or watching the service on Zoom, etc. You're most welcome. We're honoured today to have Daoud Nasser from Palestine as our guest speaker, and his theme will be love, justice and righteousness, and that will run throughout the service as it does with our opening words, which are now on the screen. The world changes, our certainties are shaken. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Nature turns against people, and people turn against nature. Yet, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. The nations are in uproar, and society totters on the brink. Yet, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. God is with us, and the God of Jacob is our refuge. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. God says, be still and know that I am God. God is our refuge and strength, we turn to God in troubling times. Our opening hymn this morning reflects this theme and is written by the well-known writer Fred Kahn and reflects very much about his concerns with peace and justice. He was born in the Netherlands in 1929 and lived through the Nazi occupation. He saw three of his grandparents die of starvation and witnessed his parents' deep involvement in the resistance movement. Interestingly, he did not attend church when he was young, but he became a pacifist later and began attending church in his teens. He eventually moved to Britain and became a minister of the Congregational, later the United Reformed Church, and it was then that he began writing his many hymns, the first of which we're now going to sing. For the healing of the nations, Lord, we pray with one accord.
And now a prayer. Lord, we thank you that we are able to come together this morning for this collective act of worship. But as we do so, we are conscious that we live in a troubled world where there are so many wars and, and people who are suffering in all manner of ways from starvation and disease. Most of us this morning are blessed with comfortable homes and have adequate resources so that we too easily forget that there is another side to life, even within our own towns and cities. Quicken our hearts to the needs of our fellow citizens, both near and far. And now, let us join together in the name, in the prayer that our Lord taught us. Loving God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Bless this day in our daily bread. Temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, in addition to a verbal welcome that may indicate that after the service, coffee and tea will be available in the foyer, and we hope that as many of you as possible will stay for a chat and get to know each other a little better. Our church secretary is away at the moment, so Simon is going to come to give us our notices. Thank you, John. And yeah, I'd like to just add my word of welcome to you. Uh, if you're visiting Bloomsbury today, it's uh, especially good to have you with us. And uh, that applies particularly, of course, to Daoud and Jihan, who it is uh, really, really good to have here. I I'm glad to be returning hospitality, because I've, I've visited your home twice, and it's good to have you here in our church home. Um, a group of us from Bloomsbury were, were at the Tent of Nations uh, back in November last year, and a, a, a different group of us from the church here with wider friends were there, I think, in 2017 as well. So it's been a privilege to get to know you and, and to walk some of this journey with your family. And we look forward to what you're going to be bringing to us later. Uh, I just wanted to um, also introduce those of you who don't know to our beautiful violinist who has come out today to join us in worship. Normally the violinist lives um, in, in the cupboard behind me uh, and comes out on special occasions. If you're wondering, the violinist is made from decommissioned weapons from the civil war in Mozambique as part of a Swords to Plowshares project from Christian Aid a few years ago. And we're very privileged to have one of these sculptures with us here at Bloomsbury. Uh, he has, I think it's a he, I'm not entirely sure, but I think it's a he. He has, he has fellow sculptures in the British Museum and in other churches. Um, and so do have a look at him. Uh, when we come to our prayers of intercession later, you'll get a chance to see him a bit more closely. Uh, in terms of um, notices, we have a church meeting next Sunday, straight after the morning service. This will not be a long church meeting. It's, it's to take, a, 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 I think, a relatively straightforward decision to spend a bit of money on the basement. There will be a paper coming around um, later in the next few days for church members to resource you in understanding what that's about. And we're hoping that will be a, a short meeting straight after the service. Uh, this evening, um, today being Pentecost, there is the Churches Together in Westminster Pentecost service, which is at the Welsh Church for Central London, uh, not too far from here in East Castle Street. Uh, a number of us will be going. If you're around at six o'clock and you would like to come and join the Welsh in what I am sure will be some brilliant hymn singing, uh, then do please come along to that. And just The service will be in English. Yes, yes. Yes, those of you who normally go to the Welsh Church will know that they, they often do their services in Welsh, but they are, they are making a concession for us on this occasion and will be conducting the service in English. I, mean, no, I, I, I worked in the Welsh Churches for eight years when I was based in Cardiff, so I'm quite used to services in Welsh, but uh, I don't really understand too much of it, but this one will be in English. 
Um, final thing to mention, um, my colleague, uh, Reverend Dawn Savage, um, is about to go on a, a long overdue sabbatical. Uh, this was delayed for a number of reasons, COVID-related and other things. So Dawn is going to be a, away from the church for three months for June, July and August. So just note that if you normally interact with Dawn that there will be three months where she's off doing other things. And Dawn, we will miss you. We hope you have a great time and we look forward to seeing you when you get back. That's it from me. Thanks, John. Um, introduce, are, we, are we at the reading next? Yes, we are, aren't we? In that case, Thomas, would you like to come and bring us our scripture reading for this morning? Kings chapter 21, verse 1 to 16. Naboth the vineyard. Later, the following events took place. Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard in Jezreel beside the palace of King Ahab of Samaria. And Ahab said to Naboth, Give me your vineyard so that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near my house. I will give you a better vineyard for it, or if it seems good to you, I will give you its value in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord, forgive that, the Lord forbid that I should give you my ancestral inheritance. Ahab went home resentful and sullen because of what Naboth the Jezreelite had said to him, for he had said, I will not give you my ancestral inheritance. He lay down on his bed, turned away his face, and would not eat. His wife Jezebel came to him and said, Why are you so depressed that you will not eat? He said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or if you prefer, I will give you another vineyard for it. But he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. His wife Jezebel said to him, Do you now govern Israel? Get up, eat some food, and be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with this, with this seal. She sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who lived with Naboth in his city. She wrote in the letters, Proclaim a fast, proclaim a fast and seat Naboth at the head of the assembly. Seat two scoundrels opposite him, and have them bring a charge against him, saying, You have cursed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. The men of his city, the elders and the nobles who lived in his city, did as Jezebel had sent word to them. Just as it was written in the letters that she had sent to them, they proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth at the head of the assembly. The two scoundrels came and came in and sat opposite him, and the scoundrels brought a charge against Naboth in the presence of their people, saying, Naboth cursed God and the king. So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death. Then they sent Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned, he is dead. As soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, Jezebel said to Ahab, Go, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money. For Naboth is not alive but dead. As soon as Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, Ahab set out to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. Here ends the reading. Thank you, Thomas. Our next hymn is written by a well-known modern hymn writer, Graham Kendrick. He wrote this particular hymn on the for the 25th anniversary <coughs> excuse me, of the Charity Tear Fund, and it was influenced by a visit that Kendrick had made to India some years earlier, when he was struck by the contrast between Indian poverty and Western affluence. The words are based on, <coughs> oh, excuse me, <coughs> on Psalm 34, quote, the Lord is near and the brokenhearted and and saves the crushed spirit. Kendrick believed that when people are feeling broken, there is a beauty in God's closeness. He's not just nearby, he said, but close, right next to us, whenever we are hurting. So let's join together to sing. Beauty for brokenness, hope for despair.
Harold, would you now like to come and give us your thoughts with your colleague, John? John? Uh, to introduce myself, uh, my, name, my name is John Howard, uh, and um, for my sins, which must be many, I am a Methodist. So the confession is over. Uh, I spent uh, some years as the Methodist mission partner in Israel-Palestine, and in that capacity um, worked with um, Dawood and the Nassar family. And indeed, I remember Dawood now, I suppose, about five years ago, when um, we were on the farm together, celebrating the award of the World Methodist Peace Prize to the Nassar family. The World Methodist Peace Prize is quite a prodigious prize um, amongst the people who previously held it, um, includes uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, and so that is a sign of the level of recognition that exists um, for the work that Dawood and the Nassar family are involved in. And I remember especially how we um, marked the place of your mother um, in this work. Um, now, you're a Palestinian and you're a Christian. Now, can you tell me how that works out? Yeah, first of all, good morning. It is wonderful to be here and thank you so much for hosting us in this church. Um, we are glad to be here, me and my wife. Um, it's nice when you ask this question is um, to remember like my name is David, Dawood is David, and David is coming from Bethlehem. And in Bethlehem also Jesus was born and today we are celebrating I think Pentecost and the church started in Jerusalem you know, when when Jesus promised his disciples you will receive you know power when you receive the Holy Spirit and you will be my witnesses starting in Jerusalem and this is you know we as Palestinians and Christians we are the followers of the first Christians so we are not converted we just were born there, grew up, and carried the Christian faith until today. And it's a sadness that for so many people, they don't appreciate that there is a Christian community of Palestine. As a Christian from Bethlehem, can you just say a little bit about how the Christian community is faring today in Bethlehem and indeed in the Holy Land. Well, we heard a story um, of Naboth's vineyard, and uh, this story happened maybe 700 years before Christ. And it is sad to say that this story is still happening today with us Palestinians there, um, because uh, the city of Bethlehem today is surrounded by a wall and surrounded by settlements. And still also we as a family, we are, our farm is being threatened to be, to be confiscated for a building of a new settlement. So the story of Naboth is talking to us today with what we are going through um, as Palestinians, as Palestinians and Christians also. Um, if, if you give me this time to, uh, to compare those stories together because we have a family farm that is located southwest of Bethlehem and the Israeli authorities are trying to confiscate the farm to build a settlement. So the king came to Naboth and said, I want your land, I want your farm. Naboth said, this is my land that I got from my parents, from my grandparents. I cannot give you my land. And he, he decided to challenge the king, to challenge the authority. And this is the story that is happening with us today. When they said, this is the land that we want to take. We said, this is our farm. 
We have this since more than 100 years. And we decided to challenge that. And we went to the court. And beside the difficulties that um, uh, we are facing, physical uh, pressure, uh, legal issues, uh, we were offered, like Nebot at that time, to sell the land. And the king offered Nebot a blank check. But the answer was, what we inherited, we cannot sell. A gift that we have, that we receive, cannot be sold. And this is the thing that we are living today with the same message. So today, as Christians, we are struggling uh, in the land. Christians are becoming a small minority in numbers. We are maybe one or less than 1% from the whole population. But again, you know, 2,000 years ago, the situation was not different because also the disciples of Christ were a small minority, but they were able to carry this message of hope all over. You know, Jesus said to us, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And a small minority can make a big difference. I know, Dao, that you've been in court now for 32 years. The military court, the Supreme Court, the military court again. Indeed, the day before you travelled to England, you were in the military court again. I also know that your farm has been attacked, uh, your olive trees cut down, um, there have been arson attacks, you've got 28 demolition orders on the property, you're not allowed water, you're not allowed electricity. How do you not end up hating those who are treating you in the way they are? Well, this is something that's very hard uh, for us to go through, as many other Palestinians, because on a daily basis, with what we are going through, it is easy to get frustrated. It's easy to get in a desperate situation, and it's easy to give up and leave. Um, so with what we are facing is forcing people whether to react negatively. You know, when, we, when people are provoked with violence, the first response will be also with violence. But we said this will never be our way. Then we came to the second option when people face challenges, they might not accept the situation as it is and say, or we want to give up and leave or just become a victim and wait for a savior to come and help. We said to ourselves, this is not our call. You know, we are called to be um, change makers. We are called, we have a mission to fulfill. We are not just there to accept what is on us, what is imposed on us. Now we are called to stand up and make a difference. And that's why we decided to uh, walk on a different path and we created another way of resistance but we had to fix ourselves because we are also people and the way we are all humans the way we love sometimes the way we have negative feelings but for us and in order not to give up we said four things that became our principles the first thing we said we refuse to be victims it was important to move ourselves out of that mentality in order to start, to start believing in ourselves and to start to stand up and do something positively. Secondly, we said we refuse to hate, although we have many reasons to, to have this negative feeling. But with hatred, people would destroy themselves from within. And we believe that all people are created in the image of God and they are not created to hate one another. So in all of us, we have good and bad things. So we want to, to respect the good in this person, but not to accept the bad. We have to stand up and tell the other what you are doing is unjust. And thirdly, we said we are acting differently, not because it's a strategy or a weakness. No, it is based on our faith. Our Christian faith is the center of this way of nonviolent resistance. And we believe in justice. Although the way for justice is too difficult, too 
complicated, but one day justice will prevail. We keep those four principles in front of our eyes in order to be able to continue the journey. With those four principles, we managed to stand up and started a new way of resistance. We started an active, a positive um, way of nonviolent resistance. And our fourth way is called we refuse to be enemies, which is an active way of nonviolent resistance. We refuse to be enemies. Well, how does that work out in practice? I mean, when you've got a farm in hot conditions and you've got trees, they need water and you aren't allowed any. Or you need electricity to work on the farm and you're not allowed any. How can you work out we refuse to be enemies in that context? Yeah, you know, first of all, you know, when we um, walked on this path, we refused to be enemies, is that um, we started to see the opportunities and to minimize the challenges that we have. So we started believing in ourselves and we started to believe like God is opening a window. We are in a dark tunnel, but still this, this candle of hope is still burning in the tunnel that will show us out to, how to get out. So we started um, seeing all our challenges there as small obstacles. Of course, we uh, have no access to running water. We started collecting rainwater inside systems. We have no electricity on the farm. We became more creative. We installed a solar power system. We, were not we are not allowed to have structures on the ground. Um, we have 28 demolition orders. We started to renovate existing caves, like building under the ground. And for us, of course, this changed the reality there or made it easier for us to exist there. But it's not only about that. It's about showing other, proving to ourselves and showing other people that things are possible. So we want to empower people through actions. Because in our situation, it's not easy to tell people what to do. People are in a desperate situation, but we have to be an image, a, you know, a, a picture to reflect God's image to them. And that's why we wanted by that to let people uh, think positively and let them see that they are able to face their challenges in a different way. So when they go through that, they should not sit down, cry, and become victims. No, they have to stand up and act. And while they are acting positively and differently, they empower themselves, but they will empower other people around them, not through telling them what to do, but through doing what they are doing. We mentioned the caves, and I don't know what image people here have of caves, but in my kind of image in my mind is normally of a dark cave, um, pretty wet and horrible. But I know that some of the caves on the farm have been beautifully decorated out. And the meeting cave, for example, um, uh, has been decorated. Um, and it's part of the work that you've done has produced that beautiful cave. Do you want to say a little bit about the children's work that has led, led to some of that? Yes, um, we use those caves now for meetings, for gatherings. Even some of the long-term volunteers live also in caves, which are also like um, having a natural air conditioning, by the way. You know, so, um, and we have also a chapel cave that we use for prayer meetings, for Bible studies. Um, and, uh, of course, like those caves, we try to renovate. And after renovation, we try to decorate them with paintings that done by children, because one of uh, one of our um, you know big uh, uh, and important projects is the children's summer camps. So after we developed the farm, we started inviting people to the farm, international guests, volunteers, because we want to empower people through our story of steadfastness and hope. And one of the things that we are doing is children's summer camps working with traumatized children, working with children that are coming from Bethlehem area, from refugee camps, 
and we try to to um, work with them to overcome their obstacles, uh, their trauma uh, by uh, investing in uh, creative uh, projects like paintings. And most of the paintings that were done on the farm are done were done by children. So uh, we do mosaics, uh, music, theater, because we want, by doing that, to let the children think positively, to let them discover their talents, focus on the positives and believe in themselves they are able to make a difference. And I know you have volunteers who help in those summer camps, but you also have volunteers coming at other times. Um, uh, I made the mistake of coming on the farm one time in the winter um, when I was um, uh, um, made, made to work hard digging holes for trees to be put in. Um, then you've got people coming for the various harvests, uh, and not just one harvest, but a whole series of harvests. Can you say a bit about the kind of role of volunteers coming and staying on the farm? Well, very important because, first of all, in a situation like ours, and especially as Palestinians and Christians, sometimes we feel, as a small minority in number, what kind of difference we can create. But um, with the presence of international guests and volunteers, we feel that we are not alone. Very important to, give the, to get this feeling. We are not alone. We are part of a bigger thing. And many people, brothers and sisters coming from abroad, not just to see dead stones, like running from one church to another, but they want to meet the living stones. And this is very important for us. Secondly, in terms of our political reality there, the international presence of guest groups and volunteers uh, is the only remaining protection for us. Because since we started to have international presence of volunteers, we do not have attacks from Israeli settlers. But also, our aim is because for us is like life is receiving and giving, we want to empower those people. Because many of the volunteers, they have also challenges in their own lives. The moment they come to the farm and see how we are dealing with our big, big problems differently, being positive, they start to think for, for themselves, well, if those people are able to change their reality with all the difficulties that they are facing, my challenge back home is nothing compared to them. So this is a way to empower people. And this is why it's important to keep this tent of nations as a light on a hill. It's not just about to protect the land, which is very important, but it's about to empower people through this story of steadfastness and hope. So if there are people listening or in the congregation um, interested in becoming volunteers and going there, um, presumably they can look on the website, I assume, and, uh, and therefore be able to find how to do so. But today is Pentecost Sunday. We mark the coming of the, the, the Spirit, um, and that Spirit guides us um, as we work for God's kingdom. Now, what's your vision as you look ahead for the farm? Where, where do you see things going? Um, what, what do you see as being the way that the Spirit is leading you in your work on the farm? Well, it's a very important through our way is to empower people, to invite people to the farm, to send them back home with a message of hope. Um, but also, like our situation will get more restricted after they finish building the wall around us in that area. And that's why we are thinking of making the farm totally self-sufficient in terms of energy, like investing in wind energy besides solar, um, recycling of grey water to be used for irrigation, uh, composting, biogas. So we, out of our needs, we started to become more creative and more environmentally aware. But our big vision is one day is to establish an educational environmental centre where we can bring people, locals, and empower them, especially children and young people, and focus on alternative energy, organic farming, community building, and nonviolent way 
of resistance in action. Of course, very important, in, even in a situation like ours, to continue to have a vision. Yeah? But maybe we might be able to achieve this vision. We might not. It's like a marathon for us, but it's very important to follow that vision, walk in small steps, and try to make a difference. But always we have to walk with faith, with love, and hope. Thank you. Thank you, Daoud. Um, I know that this afternoon we're going to be um, able to look in more detail and hear in, um, more extensively the things uh, that you're involved in. But uh, I think we would want to say, as Christians from the UK, and as Christians watching from, uh, in the media, um, that you are in our prayers, that we think of you and um, uh, pray that soon the time will come when there is peace and justice for all the people of the land. So, God be with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm sure we'd all say Amen to that. <clears throat> Our next hymn is by Irina Murray. And she began her life as a linguist but became increasingly involved in the work of Amnesty International, <clears throat> which was coupled with her views that the words of so many hymns, uh, as they then were, were quite unrepresentative of today's world and the language they used. And I must break off and say something which has rather amused me. She took as an example of this inappropriateness of hymn words that she lives in New Zealand, I might say, and at Christmas they sang in the bleak midwinter, <laughs> which seemed hardly appropriate in that part of the world. <clears throat> the hymn that we're about to sing is one of her many well-known hymns and reflects the theme of our service, God of freedom, God of justice.
prayers of intercession. Friends, usually at Bloomsbury, we pray our prayers of intercession with words. Today, we're going to pray in action. It is Pentecost Sunday, the day when the flames of the Holy Spirit descended on the disciples. So I'm going to invite you as your act of prayerful response to the, uh, to the, the words that have been brought to us this morning to come forward and light a tea light from the, and, and we, will, we will embody the pouring out of the Spirit. Through the lighting of these candles, we will symbolize the Spirit at work in our lives. And we will use that to offer our prayers of intercession. Sometimes words fail, but actions speak. So friends, join me in an act of prayerful action.
So I invite you to offer these prayers to God. When I say, Lord, in your mercy, you respond, hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Our closing hymn is one of a hundred or more written by Christopher Idle, a prolific author of articles on the public responsibility of Christians. His words are a fitting response to much of what we've heard this morning. Let's sing, freedom and life are ours, for Christ has set us free. Now some words of Paul. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Live in harmony with one another. So far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Amen.